Welcome to lesson two. In this video, I'm gonna answer four often asked questions about orthodox bell ringing. We're gonna unpack some of the terminology that we're gonna be using for the rest of the lessons. And we'll talk about the four canonical types of ringing that are performed in the orthodox church. So here we go, question one. Why do churches ring bells? Bells are rung to call people to prayer who are not already inside the church. This means from the beginning, that bells are not an extra musical element for the enjoyment of the congregation inside the church. They are a public signaling system to call everyone who hears the bells to the church. Now, the people that are outside of the church, uh, you can break that down into two very important and distinct categories. The first category of people are people that want to hear the bells or that like to hear the bells, people that believe in God, um, who live on the property or nearby, who are going to respond to the sound and actually come to church because they're being called by the bells ringing. However, in my opinion, the more important group of people that hear the bells are passive hearers, people that are not particularly interested, to people to whom it doesn't really mean anything, people who are uh, not Christians, people who don't believe in God, who are atheists, who have fallen away from the church, who have never been to church before. So there's two separate groups of people that are hearing the bells that we need to keep in mind as we ring. Bells are rung to communicate with your community. I'm talking about your neighborhood, the physical neighborhood that you live in. The church bells that you're going to be ringing on holidays, Sundays, Great Friday, on Pascha, on Christmas Day, even for people that aren't already uh, engaged with the church, the bells play an important civil function to mark out Christian holidays. And if your church has a clock tower, the bells might also be rung on the hour, the quarter hour, just to mark the passing of time. Another reason why churches ring bells is to express character of the day or of the liturgical event. So for example, to increase the joy of Pascha night, the procession, you know, it's an ecstatic, it's ecstatic moment. Or on the other hand, you can think of, you know, the, the solemn, solemn uh, remembrance at a funeral. So it, it, it sort of increases uh, the particular and highlights the particular characteristics of the liturgical day. But the most important role of church bells in our day and age is that they are a public confession of faith in Jesus Christ and an actual, not symbolic, a real proclamation of his gospel. You know, uh, to people that don't believe me, uh, I'll point to the fact that the Muslims and the communists know exactly what the power of our church bell ringing is to change lives and to bring people into a relationship with Christ. And that explains why they so violently suppressed bell ringing. Under Islam and communism, bell ringing was completely banned because they knew, perhaps better than we ourselves know, the power that church bells have to bring people closer to Christ, especially when they're allowed to ring totally unchecked in a society. If you're a church that's on the edge right now, trying to decide if you want to buy church bells but are not sure what the neighborhood is going to think, I want to encourage you not to wait for the government to give you permission to preach the gospel and be the church. So on to the next question. What makes bell ringing specifically orthodox? If you wanted a dictionary definition, here it is. Untuned tower bells that don't swing, rung by hand in layered rhythms. So let's break that sentence down a little bit, and in doing so, I'm going to talk about the five defining features of orthodox bell ringing. First, rhythmic ringing. This style of bell ringing developed over centuries out of the ancient desert monastic practice of striking the semandron, the large wooden board. And so, since it's developed straight out of that practice, all the ringing that we do is strictly rhythmic with a very accurate and precise rhythms. In order for that to happen, the bells themselves cannot swing. So the bell itself is going to be stationary and only the tongue or the clapper inside the bell is going to move. Next, these rhythms are layered. So what that means is we're not going to be ringing harmonies or melodies. 
Uh, we're going to have three separate groups of bells uh, grouped according to their relative size uh, that are ringing all at the same time but at different tempos. And these three groups of bells are going to be, the, the rhythms are going to be stacked on top of the other. So you have three separate uh, groups of bells that are ringing at a different pace, although it's the, the tempo underneath all, all remains the same. The third defining feature of orthodox bell ringing is that the bells are untuned. However the bell comes out of the mold when it's cast, that's how it's left. Each individual bell is valued for its own specific, unique voice. The bells themselves aren't ground down at all or tuned to any particular musical scale. So it doesn't exactly matter what note each bell is as long as they all sound good in relation to the other bells that are there. They don't have to be tuned to a, any particular musical scale. Next, orthodox bells are always rung by hand. We are human beings ringing bells for other human beings. Um, so we're not going to use any automated uh, ringing systems where you push a button and the bells ring. We're definitely not using any fake recordings that, uh, that are played over speakers. Uh, like everything else about Orthodox worship, we're using real materials and we're doing it by hand. Since the point of uh, ringing bells, since the main purpose is to call people to prayer who are not already gathered inside of the church, the bells need to be up in a tower. Uh, this is an outdoor thing. Bells do not belong in a closet or in an attic. This is a public communication system that extends for miles over the, uh, the neighborhood that you're in and out over the entire surrounding country. So those are the five defining features of Orthodox bell ringing. Untuned tower bells that are, don't swing, rung by hand in layered rhythms. So, on to the next question. How is Orthodox bell ringing different from the bell ringing in Catholic and Protestant churches? So I quickly want to review three types of Western bell ringing that most of us are familiar with. First, you have the swinging tower bell, um, which is the most common type of bell ringing throughout the world. You have multiple bells up high in a tower with the bell ringer down far below where the, where the bells are ringing. You have a single rope that attaches not to the tongue of the bell, uh, but actually to a wheel to which the bell is mounted with an axle. The whole bell itself is swinging uh, first one way and then the other way. That creates kind of a unique pattern where the rope goes down and then up and then down not as much and then back up and then down more. Swinging tower bells are beautiful. They ring with their own innate rhythm. You can't really speed it up or change it, which is why they are not appropriate if you're trying to ring bells in this rhythmic orthodox style just because you can't, you can't change the rhythm, you can't control it. However fast that bell rings, for the most part, is just how it rings. So next we're going to talk about the carillon. Now the carillon is a little bit more similar to what we're familiar with in the Orthodox Church because the bells themselves don't swing. Uh, the bells are stationary, they're mounted stationary, and only the tongues of these bells uh, move. Now, uh, what's unique about the carillon is that it's actually a musical instrument with bells, a large number of bells uh, that, that are tuned, specifically the inside of the bell after it's cast is ground down to tune it to a very specific note so that it can be used uh, with the others uh, with a keyboard that actually has the same number of uh, half steps as the piano. Um, and, and often you can have multiple octaves, uh, multiple repeating octaves, just like the piano, so that you can ring uh, more traditional compositions. You can ring melodies on it, you can ring harmony even. The reason that the carillon isn't really appropriate for use in the Orthodox Church, it's difficult to ring a carillon and make it sound like Orthodox Church bell ringing because of the difficulty in layering rhythms. Uh, the keys don't work like, uh, you don't ring with your fingers, you actually have to ring with your whole hand. And so to ring with the complex right and left hand rhythms that we do in the Orthodox Church uh, is very clunky and it just doesn't sound right. Not to mention the fact that the sound profile of each bell is much more, it's more specific. It's just whenever each bell rings, it's just one note and there's, uh, there's not a whole lot else that's produced. As, whereas with our Orthodox bells, since they are 
untuned, there's a very rich and sometimes even uh, dissonant sound that's created by each individual bell. A third type of familiar Western bell ringing for us are handbells. Uh, this is, you know, where you have these small portable bells that are rung by hand. Usually they're laid on a table. Um, uh, and they're rung by usually a group of people that's actually called a handbell choir because of how many people you need to ring a musical composition. Uh, they're an indoor instrument and they are used for indoor musical performances uh, and they are simply not a public signaling system, which is what tower bells are, which is the, the use of the bells in the Orthodox Church. Um, and so that's why handbells uh, aren't, aren't useful for Orthodox bell ringing. I do want to say a quick word about the use of altar bells, which are uh, a type of handbell that are, that are used in Western uh, liturgies uh, at the elevation of the Eucharist in the Catholic and high liturgy uh, Protestant uh, denominations. Uh, they're rung at the elevation of the Eucharist and a few other times. You'll actually see these used in Greek and maybe Antiochian churches, uh, churches that are part of what you could call like the Byzantine liturgical tradition. Specifically, hear them rung at, uh, during the Anaphora, for example, maybe three times when the, when the Eucharist is consecrated by the priest in the altar. Um, and you also might hear them when um, the people saying Christ is risen or at the beginning of the festal Katavasias at Matins. Now it's interesting to note that the churches that ring little handbells indoors that aren't audible outside, uh, Greek or maybe Antiochian churches, are the same churches that use the, what you could call the Byzantine liturgical tradition. Itself was heavily influenced by the fact that for several hundred years um, it was under Ottoman occupation where bells were totally uh, prohibited. Churches were not allowed to ring their bells outdoors. Uh, and so I just want to say in countries now with relative religious freedom, um, it's probably not a good idea to hold on to some of these little practices that only came about because the church was being persecuted. And I think it's important uh, that we as the church get back to spreading the gospel publicly uh, without fear and, like I said earlier, without waiting for the government to give us permission uh, to preach the gospel uh, through our bell ringing. Question four, is bell ringing just a local tradition that's practiced in some places but not others? Are there various traditions of bell ringing among Orthodox countries the same way that we have various traditions of uh, singing? Bell ringing is a universal Christian practice and is the birthright of all Christians everywhere in the world. It's synonymous now after 2,000 years. It's synonymous with our faith in Jesus Christ and it's a strong expression of Christian freedom of religion. So in short, no. Bell ringing is not just a local practice that's practiced in, in, in some countries or some places and not in others. Everywhere around the world, bell ringing is practiced by Christians. Now to answer the second half of this question about various traditions of bell ringing among different Orthodox countries, we need to take a quick tour of the history of the bell ringing in the Christian East. So bell ringing started, uh, was introduced into the church in Italy in the fifth century and slowly over several centuries spread to the Christian East. Now any bell ringing culture that may have developed, the development of bell ringing as the high liturgical art that we know today, um, that was completely made impossible uh, because bell ringing was stamped out by the Ottoman invasion and the occupation of most of the Christian countries of the Middle East. This includes Jerusalem, Palestine, Syria, Egypt, Turkey, Greece, Bulgaria, Serbia, Everywhere Islam came, uh, bell ringing was completely prohibited. Uh, again, because they knew the power of our Christian public uh, liturgical art, the power of church bell ringing um, to civilize and sanctify the whole neighborhoods, entire cities. However, by this time, bell ringing had already made its way to Christian Russia and had flourished. Uh, like actually no country uh, ever. Um, it became a high liturgical art with 
thousands of bells in each city. Each church had a number of bells. Uh, the size of the bells got enormous, almost beyond belief. And the church over the many centuries developed some extremely specific rubrics about exactly how and when bells were to be rung, and it became fully integrated into the life of the church in that country. Now, when the Ottoman rule started to end in the 1820s, bells were the first things to reemerge. Uh, and again, not in theory or in idea, but in actual reality, the ringing of bells became an expression of our Christian freedom of religion. But like I said, because of how strictly prohibited bells had been for many hundreds of years, any, the development of any bell ringing tradition was made impossible, and any, any development was almost completely lost, and so the bell ringing that you'll see now in countries like uh, Greece, uh, Turkey, Egypt, Syria, Jerusalem, Bulgaria, and Serbia is either borrowed from the intact Russian tradition or borrowed from Western bell ring that we've already covered or is sort of a combination of the two. Now the one place in the Christian East where bell ringing was never outlawed by the Ottomans was Mount Athos. Mount Athos maintained its ability to worship in its, in its usual way and in its unbroken tradition. And so there is an Athenite style of bell ringing that actually is very, very similar to what had developed independently in Russia. So it's fascinating to me to think that maybe what we're seeing today everywhere on Mount Athos is an expression of, or maybe even a continuation of the bell ringing tradition of the Byzantine Empire before the time of the, of the Ottoman occupation of those areas. So, that was a very long way to answer the question, uh, are there various traditions among all the Orthodox countries of, of bell ringing? And the answer to that is no. There are in fact only two distinct and fully formed uh, styles of Orthodox bell ringing, of that in Russia, and that uh, that you can be found on Mount Athos. So what we're gonna be learning in this course, what we're gonna be doing is focusing on what these two bell ringing traditions have in common, not the very small differences that separate them. We're gonna focus on what these two bell ringing traditions have in common, their common ground. We're gonna learn these, the, the principles that can, be, that can be found in these two different styles. Uh, we're gonna learn those principles uh, and from there be able to optimize our own bell ringing in our own place and time. So in terms of the terminology that we're going to be using for this course, the words we're going to be using to describe the different bells, the different peals, uh, the different groups of bells, we are going to be using plain English. Uh, it's going to be, the goal is for it to be very understandable and straightforward. So uh, when we're talking about the collection of all the bells together, we're going to call, just call that a set of bells. Uh, in terms of the different parts of a particular bell, um, we'll talk about the different voice, uh, the voice of individual bells or the sound that they create. Uh, we're going to use the term tongue uh, to describe the, the clapper that's inside the bell that actually makes, makes the bell uh, start to produce sound. Uh, we'll talk about the skirt of the bell or like the outer edge. You also have the lip that's around the bottom as well as the crown which is this whole area uh, on the top of the bell. Um, you have the ears that are on the side of the crown that actually um, that the, the bolts go through that hold the bell in place. Uh, and we'll use this, the term ringing lines, to talk about both uh, the ropes that are used for the right hand as well as the steel cable for the left hand. Now, one of the important things about Orthodox bells is that uh, they're rung in these three rhythmic layers and the three rhythmic layers are created by grouping the bells. So we're going to start with the smallest bells. We're just going to call them the small, the small bells. They're rung uh, just with, with their ropes all tied together by the ringer's right hand. You have the middle bells um, that are rung with uh, just horizontal lines going to, going to a post and a disc next to the bell ringer. These are going to be called the middle bells. They're going to ring more slowly than the small bells. 
and then you finally have the large bells, which we're gonna to refer to as uh, the pedal bell because it's rung with a foot pedal. Now, the pedal, pedal bells that are large, uh, typically over five or 600 pounds, uh, can be referred to as an evangelist because of the connection between the particular sonority of their sound uh, and the way in which uh, the four evangelists themselves uh, spread the gospel of Christ. Now I want to talk to you about the four canonical types of ringing in the Orthodox Church. So what this means is there are four styles of ringing bells that are explicitly called for by the rubrics uh, of Orthodox Church services. Number one is the toll. So the toll is just the ringing of one of the largest bells at a nice slow interval 20 to 40 seconds in between the stroke of each bell, and that serves as a call to prayer um, before every single service. Next, you have the peal. So the peal is this very characteristic style of ringing, which is where you have these three layers of rhythms sort of stacked uh, on top of each other, the, slow, the larger bells ringing slowly, the middle bells ringing faster, and the smallest bells ringing the fastest of all three groups. Um, you can have a peal in one, two, or three movements, which just means uh, you're dividing the, the, the ringing up into sections where you actually stop ringing all together. It's a pretty ancient practice uh, as part of ringing the peal. Typically, the more festive uh, the occasion, the greater the number of movements in the peal. So, for example, for before the liturgy on one of the 12 great feasts, let's say like Annunciation, Liturgy on Annunciation, you're going to ring a peal in all three movements with all the large bells ringing together. Um, whereas on a, just a simple weekday liturgy, just the commemoration of one of the early church martyrs, it's kind of a quiet uh, celebration. You'll, you might, uh, depending on your specific local tradition, just ring a peal only in, in one movement. So the peal uh, is always improvised. We never, we never ring from notation. Uh, it's always improvised, but we're going to improvise according to the character of liturgical day, like I just mentioned about ringing in separate movements. Uh, so the peal with these layered rhythms is where the most artistry comes into play, because it's your responsibility as the musician to channel the energy of a specific day, even the, the weather, the, the, the liturgical event, like I've said. It's a pretty high responsibility. Um, so this is going to be our main focus in this course, in addition to teaching you all four canonical peals. The real meat uh, of this course is going to be figuring out together uh, how to improvise in an, in an inspired way, uh, but also keep the ringing sounding uh, appropriate for church services. Next, you have the chain peal. Now, the chain peal is different from the regular peal because instead of ringing uh, all three groups of bells simultaneously in stacked rhythms, uh, you're actually going to ring each bell individually. You're going to ring it several times in a row, uh, seven times, five, or three times, depending on the particular occasion. Um, so you're going to start with the largest bell, ring that several times in a row, and you're going to go on to the next largest bell, and so on all the way to get to the smallest bell, and then start that whole cycle over, and you'll ring that as many times as you need to accompany whatever liturgical action is happening. The chain peel is only rung a few times throughout the year, and it's a particularly uh, solemn and festive peel. It's very distinctive. You'll never forget it once you hear it. Now, the fourth canonical type of ringing in the Orthodox Church is the funeral toll. Obviously, it's rung for funerals as well as on Great, uh, Great Friday, the services for Great Friday. The funeral toll is very similar to the chain peel in that you're ringing the bells individually. Um, they're not stacked on top of each other like for the regular peel. Uh, you're, except it's different from the chain peel in that you're going to start with the smallest bell and you only ring uh, each bell only once, which is also different from the chain peel. You start with the smallest bell, let the sound kind of die away from that, the next largest bell, and so on and so forth. You get to the, to the largest bell. And then you actually ring a chord on all the bells together and then start that cycle over. Uh, and of course, this cycle is always concluded uh, with a short peal, joyful peal on all the bells, 
that, that underscores our Christian hope of eternal life uh, through Christ's promise to us. Okay, so at the end of this long conversation about Orthodox bell ringing, I bet you're saying to yourself, okay, this is getting a little bit too specific, definitely too complicated. Why don't I just go pull on a rope out in the narthex before the beginning of liturgy and, and call it good? Well, if you understand what our Orthodox bell ringing tradition actually consists of, and wake up to why we're doing any of this in the first place, to call people to church who aren't already inside the church, and to preach the gospel to everyone who hears the bells in the whole surrounding area. Once you're awake to why we're doing this in the first place, you'll understand how important it is, why it's so important to invest time and effort into this vital public ministry of the church.